Welcome, Kevin. Thank you for taking the time to do this today. I'm really excited to find out more about all these projects you have on the go. Well, thanks for having me, man. So Kevin Kent is the owner and founder of Knifeware, yep. which is a chain of very high-end knife stores, and Kent of Inglewood, and you just released a book as well. So do you want to tell us a little bit about maybe the knife store to start and then we'll go into Kent of Angle and then the book? Yeah, sure. So it all, it started with it. Okay, actually let's back up. I'm a chef. So I've been a chef my whole life. That's all I know how to do. And I was living in London, England. And there I tried a Japanese knife one day. I went to, I went to a chef's convention and this, this guy had a few knives and all oh, these are handmade knives from Japan. And I said, oh, those are ridiculously expensive. I said, I keep my knives razor sharp. And he went, oh, okay, try mine. And I tried to, you know, you know that when you're using a knife that's not so sharp and you kind of have to saw through a tomato? Yeah. So I was kind of doing that and it went right through and stuck in the board. And I went, what? So you, you know that moment when you're, when you, you know, like when you, you got a Toyota Corolla and you think that's a really great car. Mm -hmm. And then you go and drive a BMW M3 and you go, oh, that's a different kind of car. Yeah. I had that moment, right? And uh, yeah, I eventually swapped all my knives over to Japanese knives. And when I came back to Canada nine years later, eight years later, there was no knives in the whole country I was interested in buying. So I just made a contact in Japan, imported a few knives. My plan was to, um, you know that guy at college that would sell weed to buy weed? My plan was to sell knives to buy a few more knives because yeah. I wanted to open a restaurant. And it kind of got out of control there. And now we've got six knifeware stores across Canada. Wow. And then what is Kent of Englewood? Well, Kent of Englewood came because I like to say yes to people. So customers would come in and go, oh, you've got the best Japanese knives in the world. Can you get a Japanese straight razor? I'm like, yeah, sure. I know the guy. We can do this. And then it kind of, we got brushes and we got shaving soaps and we got European razors, we got safety razors, and all the guys that were working the shop at the time, we all tried them. And we went, my God, this is the best shave I had in my life. Now, clearly I've missed a spot now, but it's a renewable resource, right? And you sell beard oil too now, right? We, yeah, so <laughs> Kent of Inglewood, what happened is we ended up having accidentally like a little men's grooming store at the back of our knife store. And it had to get out because we had created a problem. People used to love coming to the knife store because it was fun and they could hang out and we take their time and find a knife. But when Kent of England started getting really popular, there was times when you couldn't get into our store. There was people outside waiting to come inside. It just, it becomes so popular that we had ruined the shopping experience for everybody. So we finally said, okay, enough of this. You have to leave, whatever you are. And we realized, okay, this is called Kent of Inglewood. One of our, uh, one of our guys named it that and I liked it. So we kicked it out, signed a lease across the street, and then it's, we always say at Kent of Inglewood, we get you dirty and we get you clean. So we get you dirty because we sell axes and campfire equipment and uh, cooking over fire stuff. So you know when you spend a weekend camping yeah. and you've been standing around a fire and you've been chopping wood, and when you get home, you have the best shower of your life. So we get you dirty with all that kind of outdoor fun stuff, and then we get you clean with the soaps and the shaving and the pomades and the beard gear and all of that. Very cool. So how do you pick products for Kent of Inglewood? Like how do you pick the, the beard oils? Ah. Obviously the knives, you have, you have suppliers in Japan and stuff. Yeah, well and the, it's the same kind of curation process for everything. We, we get samples, we try things out ourselves. And mm -hmm. the thing is we only want to carry undeniably better products, right? So that experience that I had with the knife in 1999, where I cut with a Japanese knife and went, holy moly, that's way better. Mm -hmm. We want all of our products to have that experience. So when people use them, they go, okay, this is an undeniably better product. Makes our job easier. Right. Right. Selling great stuff's way easier than selling garbage. 
that you don't believe in. For sure. And then tell us a little bit about the book that you just published. Well, that's kind of a, a knock-on from the film. So we made the two films called Spring Hammer that focused on our blacksmiths in Japan that we deal with. And the book was kind of an offshoot of that. We always wanted to have a really good Japanese kitchen knife book in the shop, but nobody really wrote one that was right for us. Uh, so we said, okay, let's write it ourselves. And we know that our customers want to know more about the blacksmiths. And they kind of, like, I've got a really good relationship with these guys. I go to Japan two or three times a year. These are friends of mine now. So I go and make knives with them. I go and sharpen knives with them. We drink karaoke or drink uh, sake and sing karaoke, and you know it's fun. And I wanted to kind of pull back the curtain and let our customers meet the men who make the knives. So it's partly that, and then partly like the last third of the book, the last hundred pages, is really the nuts and bolts of probably the the top fifty questions people ask us in the shops, like how do you sharpen a knife? How do I choose a knife? What's a knife set? Or what's the right knife set for me? Uh, tell me about Damascus steel. You know, why is steel important? So all those kind of questions are answered at the end of the book as well. So the front half is, the front two thirds is the romance and beautiful photography by a, by a local photographer called Visti Care. He nailed it. Cool. And he shoots a medium format Pentax camera and these pictures are brilliant. So the book looks great at the very least. Yeah, I'll have to check that book out. It'd be cool. Yeah, you'll have to. <laughs> so it all kind of started you said you're an accidental entrepreneur. It all kind of started when you were selling the knives out of your backpack. You tried the, the Japanese knife. You're still a chef then, correct? Yeah, I'm still a chef. Like I said, I tried a Japanese knife, switched all my knives to Japanese, moved back to Canada. My plan, like, so I had a job. My plan was to open a restaurant eventually. That's what I really wanted to do. Yeah. So I guess I, was, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I guess I wanted to have my own business. That had, that had been a constant. I just didn't know it was going to be uh, two retail chains and then a small media company, which we are publishing books and films and, and, and well, we got a secret book coming out too. Cool. Hopefully it makes it here before Christmas, but I think yeah. we uh, have dropped the ball on that. Okay. Unfortunately. <laughs> Can you tell us anything more about that it's one? It's the secret book. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You'll find out soon enough. Cool. So how did, how did you go from selling the knives to the store? What did that transition well, the look transition, like? It just kind of, everything seems to grow organically for us. So I was working as a chef and I had all these knives at my house, tons of them, maybe 12, maybe 12. <laughs> and different chefs around town knew I had knives. Yeah. So they would call me up, hey Kevin, can you come to the shop or my restaurant and I wanna see some of your knives. Like, okay, stuff them all in my backpack, jump on my bike, cycle down, and uh, yeah, sit at a table like this in their restaurant or sometimes in the loading bay or sometimes if they had an office in the office. And we talk about the knives, sell a few knives that way. And really, it wasn't my plan to have a restaurant or have a, have a knife store. But somebody wrote an article in the Calgary Herald about it. It was one of those articles that's this big. Mm -hmm. And it said, Kevin Kent, sous chef at this restaurant, has uh, Japanese knives. Here's his cell phone number. <laughs> and my phone starts ringing so it's about November December um, in Calgary and people want to get some Christmas gifts and they're excited about handmade knives and my phone's ringing off the hook I'm getting like 15 calls a day and people are saying where's your store I want to come by and I said I don't have a store I had people coming to my house I was meeting people in their offices I uh Phil and Sebastian coffee shop. I used to use one of the tables back when they were at the old Calgary Farmer's Market oh, yeah. at uh, Cree Barracks. And I would slyly sit at a table with my inventory in a bag beside me and people would agree to meet me there. And, oh, somebody at 10 o'clock is coming. So I'd pull out my business card and just leave it on the table. So I didn't have a stall there. Yeah. So I kind of had a clandestine secret uh, store at yeah. the farmers. We have a real farmers market stall now. Actually, we have one for Calgary or for uh, Cantavigula and one for Knifeware now. Oh, cool. So we're legit now. But for a long time, it was just the secret store. It seemed to take off. And I thought that was the end of 2007. So we started in July 2007. Oh. By January, I thought, let's make this happen. So we, uh, we rented a uh, uh, a storage locker, not a locker, as a like a. We rented the closet of a little grocery store that was in Inglewood. So we, so I had a I had a ten foot by twelve foot room, 
and put a couple of cases in, put a bunch of knives on the wall, uh, had some knives in there, so it bumped up my inventory by this time quite a bit. Yeah. I probably had 20 or 30 knives by this point, maybe even 40. And uh, everybody thought it was the lunchroom for the staff because it was just, you had to go to the back of the store and then kind of go around the corner and look in and get the courage to come in the room. It started to really take off. It became really popular and we were there for about eight months before we realized we've got to have a bigger space. Mm -hmm. So by January the following year, so that would have been 2009, we moved into what I call my mega store, which is the Inglewood store we have now. Wow, very so cool. That's how we got there. Did that answer the question? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. So I was really excited to do this interview because my first job as an adult was selling knives. I sold Cutco knives for, for three years, worked in management a little bit in the, in the kind of lower end of the business. Um, so quality knives have always been something that's interested me when I go to a friend's house and they have the really cheap plastic ones and you're trying to saw through, <laughs> saw through things. It's just, it's just terrible. So a terrible knife <laughs> makes cooking a terrible chore. Yeah. It's not fun. So obviously Cutco doesn't compare to something like your, what you guys sell. Well, the big, the big difference is Japanese knives are made with harder steel, uh -huh. right? And much harder steel means they're going to stay sharp longer and it means we can make them sharper. It also means that uh, when you look at them, because quite, quite a lot, a lot of our knives are really beautiful. Yeah. When you look at them, you kind of go, ah, oh, I love this knife. <laughs> I feel inspired. Uh, how much difference can you tell between one of those kind of knives and something like a high-end Hinkle's or Wusthof sort of mm, They're very, very different. Yeah. I think Japanese knives are more like, think about like a Ferrari. Yeah. Super fast, built to be really fast, built, but it's not built to be rugged. So European knives or Cutco knives are really built to be rugged, uh -huh. but I would argue that they're never really sharp. They're like a 4x4. Handy, handy to have a 4x4 in your kitchen, but yeah. we like the really fast ones. <laughs> yeah, so those cool. are, yeah, those are the Japanese knives. They're just, like I said, sharper and stay sharp longer. So with typical use, how often do you need to sharpen them? Uh, that's a hard question. Yeah. If if most people don't sharpen their knives even right? right most people don't go out and get their knives sharpened yeah. but with typical use one or two years they can come back to us if they wanted to keep their german knife kind of that level of sharp it would probably be six to eight months okay very interesting and then what does the process look like for making those knives is it layers of steel uh, yes and no well this is you've opened a big question here so yeah. when i get really boring yeah. Just give me a signal. Basically the way a Japanese knife is built, they put a hard piece of steel down the center and then they wrap softer steels around the outside. And that is to protect it because the steel is so hard that, for example, if it wasn't wrapped with the softer steel, if you dropped it on the ground, it would just break. Yeah, it's more fragile. Right? Because this here, this is really hard. This is super hard stuff, but it's not strong. It'll break if you drop it. But if we wrap it in rubber and drop it, better chance it'll survive. So that's what the Japanese do. And I know it sounds like silly that you're saying, oh, softer steel and harder steel. What are you talking about, man? Steel's hard, but there's degrees. So step one, if you're a blacksmith, you would either buy a bar of steel that's already laminated with those three steels, or you would make it yourself. You would put down one piece of steel. You'd get, you'd get your three pieces of steel hot, put down the soft steel, put flux on, put the hard steel on, more flux, which is like a, think about it like a powder that melts and kind of cleans the steel. Mm -hmm. So that you don't get corrosion between the uh, pieces. Right. And then you put the next piece to it, you get a little sandwich, stick that in the fire and then just hammer it to death. Cool. And that forge welds the three pieces of steel together. And then from there you start stretching it out, making it into a knife shape, and then you would, you know, perfect the shape of the knife either through a punch or forming it by hammer or forming it by like a strange cutting machine they have. And then you would heat treat it which is, you know, quenching, tempering, and annealing. So it's like three processes to, to get the steel hard, but also to make it tough as well. Mm -hmm. And then you would polish it, grind the sides so it has an edge, do a final sharpening, more polish, engrave the name, put the handle on, stick it in a box, and send it to Canada. So how long does the process typically take? Fastest I've ever made a knife from start to finish was eight hours, but I didn't anneal it properly because that generally takes three or four days. So <laughs> when you see it on forged on fire and the reason why a lot of those knives break is because they just didn't have the time to do it properly. There's ways to get around it, but 
if you wanted to do it really well, it would take you more time. But it's a TV show. Yeah. It's fun. I've never really asked anybody, because nobody starts one process with one knife, goes from start to finish. Right. What they'll do is they'll say, okay, I'm going to make 90 sandwiches of steel today. And then I'll take those 90 and hammer them into a santoku shape. <laughs> so like there's processes and you, and you just kind of walk it through. Um, the Mortakas, for example, is a family that I've been working with that make uh, kitchen knives by hand. Um, but they've been working as blacksmiths for this family since 1293. Right? Wow. <laughs> okay. So for like 720 years, more, 25 years, they've been a blacksmithing family. They started as swords and, well, and everything. But now they only make kitchen knives. Um, but they can trace their lineage through back through 27 generations of blacksmiths, which is amazing. There's three of them work full-time blacksmiths, and I think they have, well, I know they used to have one part-time guy, and I think they have two part-time guys now. Um, and they can do about 300 knives in a month. Wow. But they're fast. Yeah. Not everybody can do that level of production with yeah. that few people, but they're quick. Incredible. So when you first started out, when you first opened your store, what challenges kind of from an entrepreneurial standpoint came along with opening the store initially? All of them. <laughs> Every single challenge happened. I think business is all about challenges. It just, it's just, it's the nature of it. It's how you deal with the challenges. I had no retail experience. I've never had a retail job. So I suppose that was probably a challenge. I don't speak Japanese very well. So that's, that makes things tough. Probably our biggest challenges when we started out, because we bootstrapped everything. I've never had outside um, funding. Mm -hmm. So we started the business with $8,000. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so we started the business with $8,000 11 years ago, and now we've got 11 stores across Canada. When you first got the big store in Inglewood, did you ever- Oh my God, I was so terrified. <laughs> I had to pay them $2,000 a month for rent, forever, for five years, for the rest of my life, as far as I can tell. I imagine it's a little bit more now. <laughs> Some landlords are better than others. Yeah. <laughs> so did you ever have months where you were worried you weren't gonna, you weren't gonna make rent? Yes, but I worked really hard in the early days. Like I was doing, uh, restaurant consulting, I was doing menu writing, <laughs> I, was, uh, I was helping people switch the restaurant from one concept to another. I was doing mobile sharpening, so I was going out and sharpening at different stores. Around. Like, I was doing anything. I was writing articles for magazines. I was doing anything to make ends meet. So yeah, there was always that constant fear, because it had to make money right from the beginning, because I didn't have another job. So was it that fear that inspired the work ethic, or was it just passion, or uh, what oh, got you up in the morning? Oh, serious work ethic just came from being a chef, I think. As a chef, you have very, uh, you have tons of deadlines to meet every hour. <laughs> Some of them are within minutes of each other, and you don't get to go home till the day's over. So, <laughs> so I think having come from that kind of environment that was super high octane, I, don't know, I think it was just really good training for me to become a business owner. Awesome. And money. Actually, when you say, what is the heart? It was the money all the time. Yeah, it was like, can I make rent? Can I pay my staff? You know, because we would sometimes have days where we had sales of zero dollars and zero cents. That's hard. Yeah. It's hard when you string those together and have two in a row. So yeah, that was it. And the bank never wanted to know me. They're like, no experience. Japanese knives, that's a terrible idea. Inglewood, that's a terrible place. So yeah, there was no funding to be had. Yeah. And like, anyway, so that was, that was probably our number one. Are you happy it, you didn't ha need to get funding? I imagine in the long oh, I'm really run, proud of it now. Better. Yeah, I still own 100% of the company. Yeah. And uh, we don't have any uh, accounts receivable either, really. Like, we're, we don't have any debt. We're in good shape. That's great. Did you ever consider quitting? Like, no. No? No, I don't want to be a cook anymore. <laughs> No, my biggest fear, my biggest fear is it all comes crashing down tomorrow and I have to get a job as a chef again. I don't think I can. It's hard work. What did work-life balance look like when you were first starting out? <laughs> work-life balance. Um, I worked a lot, but I liked what I was doing, so that made it helpful. <laughs> so you didn't, you didn't do much outside of work and work-related things then and knife-related things? Lucky, I like my job. <laughs> work, work and life blend pretty seamlessly at times. You know, sometimes, for example, I'm working, but I might be in Mexico. 
I find that acceptable. Yeah. I wake up in Mexico, I have two hours of, you know, emails or telephone calls, but then I'm in Mexico and then I have the rest of my day to have a holiday. Yeah. So sometimes work-life balance looks like that. Uh, one of the rules we have at our shop actually at our, in our company now is that if you're on holiday, you cannot answer emails. It's forbidden. So, and that's, and you're, you're, so we, we set our autoresponder that says that. It says, I'm on holiday, and as knife where law is, I can't answer emails. And I'll actually go in and change my, especially my managers, I'll go and change their emails because they try to cheat. And uh, holidays are for that. You have, to, you have to recharge your batteries, get new ideas, and be relaxed and have fun. Yeah. And not think about your emails. Yeah, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm really good at preaching work-life balance for my staff, yeah. and I'm getting better at it. That's I'm 11 good. years in, and I'm getting better at it. Cool. Doing the book was really helpful, yeah. because I, it was a huge undertaking, and I had to settle down and write a book. So I just told everybody, ah, I can't do any work. I put my autoresponder on for three months, and said I'm away, I can't, I can't uh, respond. Where I can when I, I will when I can. And I think that was really helpful to remind me that I've got a really excellent team mm -hmm. that doesn't need me to coddle them. Yeah. So what advice do you have for entrepreneurs who are at that stage where they want to step out of the business, stop being the bottleneck and delegate? Open lots of stores or, or expand to the point where you can't do everything. Because that's the best part. Just right? that's, yourself into yeah, it. Yeah, I just kind of force myself into it. You know, they, uh, I have to be honest, when I'm in the shops now, I'm kind of like that weird uncle that just gets in the way. And he's well-meaning, but he does everything wrong. <laughs> so I just, I do, I do uh, we've got a new computer system that I haven't worked with. Yeah. So even just ringing through a customer now is difficult for me because I have to go and learn right from the beginning. Oh, how does this work? So uh, yeah, I'd say if you, if you want work-life balance and you want to delegate, expand to the point where you just can't do everything. <laughs> yeah. So, do you have any for things to consider before they launch a business? Make sure you can get enough of whatever you want to sell and make sure you really, really like it because you're going to be doing it a lot. And if you don't love what you're trying to sell, you'll get bored of it and it won't, uh, it'll be hard to inspire yourself. What do you have for goals for the book in the future? What do you want to do with that? What do I want to do with the book? We're, I want to be on the bestseller list. It's not going to happen. Unfortunately, this is the bestseller list work really interesting. I won't get on it because it, it counts sales through bookstores only. Oh. So for example, we sell a lot of books at my knife stores uh -huh. and we sell a lot of my book, but those don't count. Uh -huh. So uh, anyway, what do I like with the book? I would like a lot of people to read the book and for people to pat me on the back and say, well done, because that's quite fun. Um, it's interesting getting into things like a book because this is intellectual property mm -hmm. and this book is going to be also next year it will be in the stores and it will still be the book we want it to be and I don't have to write it again next year and that's exciting. Yeah. That's really exciting. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> but we're already, like, I'm already planning two more books now. I quite liked it actually. Yeah. Yeah. So, hey, more books. Yeah, it's exciting. So now that you have six knifeware stores and five Kento, five Kento Vingo, Vingo, yeah, yeah, so eleven stores. What kind of challenges are you facing now that you're at this point in your growth? Our biggest challenge right now is staffing at the store level and then getting people into the management pipeline. So we're looking to the future all the time now. Like I want to, honestly, we could have stopped at six stores and I'd have a really nice little life but then all of my senior managers would eventually just leave because they would be bored because there's nowhere for them to grow mm -hmm. so we just keep expanding uh, in ways that uh, keep our staff motivated and make sure that there's places for people to move up into and then make sure that we have enough people in the pipeline from the from the entry level that we can keep funneling them into uh, management so that's our probably our biggest challenge these days but mm -hmm. I don't see it so much of a Challenges can sound like a bad word. I don't know. I just kind of see it as a fun game. Yeah. Is there anything that, that's kind of a something you struggle with more that's maybe less so a challenge and more so a problem that you're trying to overcome? Uh, our biggest problems that we have is inventory. 
because we don't buy a lot of mass-produced items. So for example, if you are a blacksmith that produces knives, let's say, I want to buy a hundred. You're like, that's an excellent idea, Kevin. I will go and buy some steel now and make those for you, right? And if I start ordering more than you can produce, I'm just not gonna get them, right? Because we've outstripped your production. So that is one of our things. We would have a Toronto store already if we could have nailed down enough inventory <laughs> in different ways. So, but I think we've got this under control now too, because now we have monthly standing orders with everybody. We've got a lot of, we've got a lot of systems in place to make sure that we don't run out of knives because I hate having hungry stores and no knives to feed them. Have you had to look for more blacksmiths? Yeah, look for more blacksmiths, kind of forge better relationships sometimes. And also we've been buying more um, uh, factory produced knives just to kind of supplement things. Just because they're not made by a man with a hammer and an anvil doesn't mean they're bad knives. They're just not kind of as romantic. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think we've cracked it now. Can you get factory produced knives that are comparable? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we only buy stuff that's awesome. Um, but again, it's like, uh, it's all from Japan. <laughs> all of our knives are from Japan. But our, yeah, so our biggest problem right now is just making sure that we have enough inventory. Mm -hmm. But I think we're there now. That's great. How so Toronto, ever, watch out. That uh, good relations, yeah. uh, expanding to more producers, uh, investing in the producers, like we've been helping them recruit. Like when I go to Japan, uh, the last time I was there, I spoke at two different high schools about how great the quality products that are created in their neighborhood or in their city. So I go there and, and basically try to help them recruit because uh, the blacksmiths, though with the book and with our customers, they, they're quite famous here amongst our stores. But in Japan, they're just kind of seen as welders, right? So nobody really knows what's going on. And most of the places that we buy our knives from, these towns that produce all these knives, they don't have uh, recognition. Like people don't even know that these knives are built there or made there. So my job sometimes is to go to high schools and give them a talk about international trade and how the product made in their backyard are really popular outside of Japan and that this is an exciting industry to be part of. So I help them recruit now too. And all kinds of stuff. Wow, very cool. <laughs> it is super fun. That's, that's fascinating. The, there's a lot of facets to, your, to your, the work you're doing. There's a lot of moving parts. But that's handy because I like being busy. That's good. That's really good. So out of the last, I guess, 11 years now, yeah. what do you think you've learned that is very essential for entrepreneurs? Like this series is really about trying to bring value and education to up and coming business owners. Yeah. What do you feel really stands out that you should share with other entrepreneurs? Things that I wish I knew were you don't need a business plan, <laughs> although the, you need a business plan if you want to secure funding from the bank. Mm -hmm. But everybody I know that has a business plan and tried to stick to it, they couldn't because business ebbs and flows and things change at all, all time. So be prepared to duck and dive. Be prepared to do things you didn't think were on your business plan, but are a good idea. You know, be flexible and uh, take care of your staff. Take care of your staff. They're the ones that build my business, right? So typically in retail, you pay minimum wage and don't do anything nice for them. We've always paid a living wage to start, which is enough for a family of four to live off of, right? So we've always paid a living wage. We uh, do profit sharing. We have above and beyond bonuses. We do, uh, we've got a health spending account. We have, really, we have champagne Saturdays. We do uh, really great Christmas parties. And if you've been with us for 10 years, you get a three month paid holiday. Wow. Come on, that's cool, right? That's great. And uh, Kasumi's coming up in 2020, and then we've got two people the year after that, and three people the year after that. Wow. And they're already making their plans, right? Uh -huh. And this is retail. People don't stick around in retail generally, and they, yeah. they ch tend to churn through their staff. But these are the people building my brand. These are the people that are front facing. These are the people that talk to customers every day. Why don't I want people that are super experienced, great at their job and like it? So take care of your staff, mm -hmm. super important. Very cool, that makes sense. 
So, it does make sense. <laughs> Actually, I really, I want to be emphatic about that. Yeah. Take care of your staff. They're the ones that take care of your customers. Yeah. Right? Your customers, like at a retail store, uh, selling what we sell, I think our customers want to see the same people all the time. Right? They build a relationship with them. Why would I want them to go away? I don't. So I want to keep them. Let's make retail a really great career for them. Yeah. and then keep expanding so they have opportunity to move up. So what's your goal for Knifeware and Kent of Inglewood in say 10 years from now? Well, like immediate plans of what's going on, we've got, we're gonna have a, so we've got Knifewares in Calgary, Edmonton, Ottawa, and Vancouver. Toronto is clearly on the plan. So is Kyoto, Japan. And then all of those stores we want Kent of Inglewood's. I, I see in the future, probably two Vancouver stores. Like if we're looking 10 years down the line, say we probably have two Vancouver stores for Knifeware, maybe two for Kent. Certainly uh, in Toronto, two or three stores. Uh, Kyoto, Japan with both brands. Um, I want to start investing in a factory in Japan. Like I want to harness some of our own production there. Mm -hmm. So I want to make kind of a, I need some Japanese partners for this, but I want to make a blacksmith, blacksmithing school partnered with a blacksmithing production factory as well. Wow. Well, that's exciting. let's make it cool. Let's recruit yeah. some people and let's, let's give them an exciting life they can throw themselves into, an exciting career, and uh, give them a place to learn it and then give them a place to practice. Yeah. Cool. Can I uh, come shoot video of your factory when it opens? Yeah, man. Sweet. <laughs> Great. Well, I think that's all I have for questions. That was really fascinating. I'm really excited to see what you do with all the stores and oh, the production. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'll have to, uh, I might have to come get one of your knives. Might? They're, they're amazing. Might. <laughs> <laughs> After trying one at the, the market there, I was like, wow, this is, this is really something else. It's a totally different thing, right? Yeah. It's like, on another you level. You come with it, you're like, oh, this is not what I've done before. Yeah. Right? <clears throat> it makes it really easy for us to sell our product that way too because it's undeniably better. Mm -hmm. And then we're just nice to our customers. We, you know, we, we, we've written on the back wall of all the stores, everyone must leave happier than when they arrived. Uh, which is good, like, and, and, and I mean staff, I mean customers, I mean the delivery driver. Yeah. Let's just make everybody's day. So if we can make people's day, let them find a product that's undeniably better, educate them about them and entertain them, in the end they'll buy some knives or yeah. our product. I, I think it's that simple. Sure. We, we apply hospitality. <laughs> That's great. Where can people go to find out more about you and what you're doing? Uh, well, knifeware.com, <laughs> kentofinglewood.com, and longladdermedia.com. Long Ladder Media, and that's yeah. the book and film book company? Book and films and some other stuff. They're working on a TV show as well. Cool. Yeah. It's really exciting. Awesome. It is Thank fun. you so much for your time. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Cheers, buddy. Our first sponsor is Symbol Syndication, which is a video production company that I started. We do video production and online marketing for businesses of all sizes, ranging from solopreneurs to Fortune 500 companies. Our second sponsor is Gravity Cafe. They've been gracious enough to give us their space. The coffee's awesome. They have live music three nights a week. The beer's great. It's an awesome place to come hang out. Another sponsor of the Ambition Project is Business Link. Business Link is Alberta's entrepreneurial hub. They are a nonprofit organization that helps people navigate the steps towards starting their own businesses. Just because you're in business for yourself doesn't mean you're in business by yourself. Business Link's team of in-house startup experts are there to support you all along the way. Our next sponsor is the Better Business Bureau. Your BBB helps businesses build visibility, credibility, savings, leads, and community through BBB accreditation while funding free marketplace services with more than a million instances of service to consumers every year. Visit bbb.org forward slash Calgary to learn more today.